Hi, Tony DeWitt here, Missouri appellate attorney, retired, a guy who likes to make the law make sense. And today, it's one of those videos that everybody loves, lawyers behaving badly. So let's jump right into it. This is one of those that those of us who are ethical lawyers absolutely detest because the person who performed these tasks in this case um, is the epitome of somebody who takes advantage of people. And it really, really disgusts me to have to bring this to you. But, you know, it is important for purposes of full transparency that you get a look not only at the good lawyers and even some of the just fair and okay lawyers, as we've seen recently in some of the criminal cases, but also that you get a look at the ugly boils on the behind of the legal profession. And this guy, this guy is not going to be in the legal profession for at least five years, at least not in Florida. And I think we can all take great comfort in that. So let's get on to the story. Now, today we don't have an opinion from the Florida Supreme Court. What we have from the Supreme Court is a filing that was the report of the referee. Now, the way legal professional discipline works is there is a referee that is appointed, which is usually a state trial judge, and he comes in and he hears the case and he makes recommendations to the Supreme Court based on the violations, if any, that he finds in the case. And then the Supreme Court takes those recommendations and either adopts them or, if the other side objects, holds a hearing and an oral argument on the case. And there have been a number of those recently, and I'm hoping to cover one of the ones that should be coming out shortly. But this is one of those where instead of going in and fighting the good fight to keep his bar license, this guy just rolled over and played dead. And I think when you see what happened here, you'll understand. Now, one of the things about the law is that the law tries very hard to equalize imbalances in power. So, for example, when you are an 18-year-old young woman who is starting her job as perhaps a, a secretary or a clerk or something of that nature in a big business, and you have a 40-something, 50-something old, dirty old man who keeps coming around telling you you have great legs and, you know, asking if you want to go out to lunch, just the two of us and that sort of thing. Well, in that situation, there is an, an option for you to go and file a complaint. And if that doesn't get the job done, you can file a sexual harassment case because he is creating a hostile work environment. Unfortunately, when you are a basically somebody who needs legal help, you don't have the right to file a sexual harassment complaint against your lawyer and collect damages. What you have a right to do is alert the bar and let them know. But the worst possible situation you can have is a lawyer who wants to take advantage of you when you absolutely don't have the ability to push back at all. And that's something of what we have in this case. So this is the report of the referee. And it says, in September of 23, the bar filed its complaint. Copy was served on the respondents. And on February 9th, a final hearing was held in this matter. Respondent did not appear for the final hearing. The bar submitted four exhibits in consideration, which were accepted by the court. Specifically, Exhibit 1, the amended complaint and certificate filed in Ohio. Exhibit 2, which is the overview of the facts of the Board of Professional Conduct of the Supreme Court of Ohio. Exhibit 3 was the slip opinion from Ohio. And Exhibit 4 was the order of the Supreme Court of Ohio. The respondent filed his health chart for consideration by the court. The referee has used independent discretion and recollection of the evidence and testimony that were presented during the entirety of this case. 
The legal authority relied upon by the referee in making the recommendations below is included within this report. All items properly filed, including pleadings, recorded testimony, exhibits, that sort of thing. Jurisdictional statement. The respondent's at all times a member of the Florida Bar. In addition to membership in the Florida Bar, the respondent is currently a member of the State Bar of Ohio. So this is a special kind of disciplinary action. It is based on what happened in Ohio. So it's called reciprocal discipline. It's not uncommon for lawyers who, for whatever reason, decide they want to be able to practice in more than one state. They will get a license in their home state, Ohio, and then they'll get a license done in Florida because apparently there are a lot of people who want to come retire here as an attorney. And, hey, you know, I'm one of them. But they do that so that they can practice down here. Now, I didn't get a license in Florida because I don't want to practice in Florida. I don't want to practice anymore at all, really. <laughs> I, I could have if I'd wanted to get a, 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 you know, a license here. I could have done that. That's what this gentleman did. And then while he was practicing in Ohio, he ran afoul of the, the licensure requirements up there and he got disciplined up there. And now that case has been reported to the disciplinary authorities in Florida and Florida is getting ready to take action. The following allegations and rules, findings of fact, conclusions of law, and recommendation of the Board of Professional Conduct dated December 9, 2022, and the Ohio Supreme Court order of April 27, 2023, provide the basis for the discipline to be imposed in this matter. So count one is inappropriate texts. Respondent was appointed as counsel for a juvenile on allegations that her newborn daughter was an abused, neglected, or dependent child. C.L. was a vulnerable client because A. She was young, a mother facing the possibility of losing custody of her child due to the child testing positive for fentanyl at birth. B. Because she had a mental health disorder, addiction. And C. Because she did not have the support of her parents. Respondent did not have a consensual relationship prior to the formation of the attorney-client relationship. The reason that's important is because if you have a prior relationship with somebody before you start representing them, it's okay to continue that relationship. But if you develop a relationship or you develop feelings for the client while you're representing them, you have to withdraw because your objectivity is now compromised. And so they make reference to the fact that they didn't have a relationship before because it does not provide any mechanism for him to claim that they did and therefore that everything that happened was okay. After his appointment, respondent began communicating with CL through text message and at times in person expressly soliciting um, an illicit relationship with CL. Those solic solicitations included, I'm interested in a relationship with you, I want you, um, I think, well, as, as, as far as a time with you, I can send considerable time, not a problem with dating, spending time, and I'm, um, attracted to you. By the way, you have a nice body. Can't wait to get my hands all over it. Let me just say, if your lawyer sends you a text like that, first of all, he's an idiot because he has to understand that things like that live on forever. On his phone, on the other person's phone, it is it is as stupid a thing as you can possibly imagine. So you don't have a good lawyer if he's sending you those texts, because like I said, he is a knucklehead. But I digress. I want you to be my woman and let me be your BF, I guess that's boyfriend, I'd kind of like the idea of treating you like a girlfriend. These are, are really kind of sick. Although respondent did not have a relationship, he acknowledged that the above solicitations and similar communications were sent to solicit a relationship. During the course and representation of the communications described above, CL became uncomfortable with his advances. She mentioned what was occurring to the biological father who talked to the attorney ad litem, he, she, he basically said to the biological father, my attorney is a creep and I'm stuck with him. During a visit by the assigned guardian ad litem, they told her about these texts 
and she filed a complaint with the disciplinary council. Let me just say that GAL is a hero. She could have ignored that. She could have said, well, you need to deal with the bar with that. But she didn't do that. She, thought, she realized that the ethical rule says if you become aware of somebody who is acting inappropriately, who is breaking the rules of professional conduct, you have an obligation, a legal obligation, to bring it to the bar's attention. And she did it. I can tell you there are a lot of attorneys who will not do that under the theory of go along to get along. Obviously, this GAL did not want to go along to get along, and she reported him to the bar. The disciplinary council began an investigation, and so he reached out to the gal to find out, you know, what happened. And she said, well, you know, I talked to the guardian ad litem, and I told him what happened. He said, well, you didn't send him any texts, did you? And she said, no. So she didn't worry about it. But then the disciplinary council goes out and talks to her, and she gives him all of the texts, all of the texts this guy sent. So he writes a letter to the in response to the letter from the bar that he gets that says, hey, we've had a complaint filed against you. He writes this letter. I did not send inappropriate text messages. I did not have with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. Anyway, I did not send these messages as alleged by the GAL. I believe that due to his inexperience, Mr. Wagner was misled by CL somehow in an attempt by her to either gain leverage in her case, gain favor with the GAL, so he would make a, she would make a more favorable recommendation. That's what he says. Those statements were false, and for the purpose of these other statements, that was an attempt to shift blame. During the investigation of the matter, the disciplinary council took the deposition of the respondent. And it was through the deposition respondent discovered that his text messages had been supplied. Until he learned, until then, he had not found out, and the respondent was not going to admit to the disciplinary council that he sent them. Based upon the party's stipulation and the testimony adduced at the hearing, the panel found by clear and convincing evidence that respondent engaged in professional conduct in violation of the, of the rules of Ohio's professional conduct, and he was charged with one count in an amended complaint of violating their rules. A lawyer shall not knowingly make a material false statement of material fact and conduct that adversely reflects on the lawyer's fitness to practice law. And then he failed to come to the court and failed to be there for the proceedings in this particular case. So the respondent stipulated that his conduct resulted in being removed from the county court in Ohio and from the list of attorneys eligible as appointment. Based upon the party stipulations and the testimony adduced, the panel found by clear and convincing evidence that he had engaged in professional misconduct. They recommended, or the referee recommended, that the respondent be found guilty of violating the rules regulating the Florida Bar, specifically Rule 4.6. I find that the order of the Supreme Court issued on April 27 shall be considered conclusive proof of such misconduct. And so they found him guilty of violating Rule 1.8, prohibiting a lawyer from soliciting or engaging in activity with a client unless a relationship existed prior to the client-lawyer relationship. 8.1, prohibit a lawyer from making false statements of material fact, prohibiting a lawyer from engaging in conduct that adversely reflects on a lawyer's fitness to practice, and prohibiting a lawyer from engaging in conduct that is prejudicial to the administration of justice. Let me tell you what he did. He thought he had this girl over a barrel. He thought, I just need to apply a little bit of pressure and I will be able to do all the things I want to do with this one. That kind of behavior is just so irresponsible and so absolutely evil. Um, I, I can't condemn it in words strong enough. If you are a lawyer and you are representing a client, you have a sacred honor a sacred duty to take care of that client to the very best of your abilities. And that does not mean taking advantage of them. It means taking care of them. And unfortunately, that guy must have been absent that day in law school. So, the standards for imposing lawyer sanctions 
basically held that he should have been suspended for two years. And so that's what he recommended. One of the most direct and important notices we give parents in dependency is a lawyer. Notice an opportunity to be heard, an opportunity to be represented by a lawyer. Outside of criminal cases, it is really the only place where we appoint free lawyers. And so there's a special vulnerability of a parent in a dependency case. And that's sort of what I was getting to. The franchise of a law license really the entire profession's representation that everyone who, rep who exercises that franchise shares in and is bound and committed to the values associated with our bar, our licensure, the oaths we take, and the professionalism by which we are bound. That membership is a representation of all of us. That is really what I'm looking at in bar cases, which is, do I need to be worried about the rep that representation? And in a case like this, I do. I recommend the respondent be found guilty and get a two-year suspension payment of Florida Bar's costs. So this is the report that he files with the state bar. But this is the order that is issued by the state bar of Florida. Upon consideration of the referee's report and motion and access costs and that sort of thing, the court hereby approves the referee's findings of fact and recommendations as to guilt but disapproves the rec referee's recommended sanction of a two-year suspension. Instead, respondent is disbarred, effective 30 days from the date of this order, so that respondent can close out his practice and protect the interests of existing clients. If respondent notifies this court in writing he's no longer practicing, then he can start his disbarment earlier. And then they bailed him for $1,562.76 for what happened here. Now, obviously, if they're recommending a sanction of suspension, in Ohio, this lawyer probably got a suspension. In Florida, he was clicking along just fine, representing people right up until the time that this case went to hearing and the referee's report went in and now he's no longer eligible to practice in Florida, which is a good thing. There are a lot of lawyers who are like me who don't have a problem filing a, an ethical complaint against a lawyer when we have evidence that they are breaking the rules. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what we should do. And so we do it. I think it's very important if you have a problem with your lawyer that if you doubt that he is taking kind of care of you that you need to have taken care of you, or if he's doing silly stuff like this, sending you stuff that he wants to, you know, do things with you that he shouldn't be doing, then for heaven's sakes, report him to the bar. Anybody can make a report against a lawyer to the state bar. Now, whether or not the state bar does anything, that varies a great deal based on where you are. Some state bars, like California, are not Johnny on the spot. They, uh, they don't spend a lot of time investigating every complaint. Basically, they send a letter to the lawyer, and if the lawyer says, ah, it's all nonsense, then a lot of times they don't investigate it. That's how Tom Girardi was able to steal millions of dollars from clients. So just a word to the wise, if you have a, a lawyer and he's acting squirrely, the time to get out of that relationship is as soon as possible. Find another good ethical attorney to get into a relationship with for your case. So that's what I have for you today. Uh, it's kind of a kind of an ugly case to talk about, but it is definitely a lawyer behaving badly. So thank you very much for being here. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments down below. Like, share, subscribe, you know all that stuff we ask you to do. And of course, if you, uh, if you want to, you can email me with your comments up above. Try to do a kindness for somebody today and then come on back down here tomorrow. We'll join us at the beach and we'll talk about something else. Hey, as I said at the beginning, none of what I said is legal advice. But let me tell you what, the stuff that's going to be right up here, these are the things that YouTube thinks you might be interested in going forward. Have a terrific day.